Well, there's many different styles of framing, so that's one of the first things you have to do is decide if you want to have a, a mat and um, a smaller frame and um, no mat plein air style, or there's, I'm not sure I pronounce this correctly because I don't speak French, uh, passepartout, uh, which means that painting is right against the glass instead of having a spacer. Um, and you have to decide if you want a liner or a, a fillet in uh, the frame. And then also, I think when you're doing your painting, you have to keep in mind a little bit about the frame. Uh, when I do my paintings, I put little dots around how much the um, frame lip will cover over my painting. And I started doing that because I had a painting that I thought was good spacing, uh, unequal, because you don't want everything even. And then I put the frame on it, and all my care about t making it uneven, now all the junipers were very even around because of the quarter inch on each side that was taken off. So I started uh, marking. And not only for that, but some frames have a shadow here, and um, you want to consider that when you're uh, planning your painting. In our national show, I caught someone going like this, taking it off the wall wow. to oh. see. So, um, and of course I told them, no, no, no. But it apparently was so bothersome, that shadow. Um, so the kind of frame you pick uh, will have more or less of a shadow that can obstruct. <coughs> and also, um, when you're framing, you have to consider simultaneous contrast, which is um, sort of the theory of relativity. Everything is how it looks because of what it's next to. And I'll talk about that uh, when I put together my frame. Um, things that are, are dark will make everything else look lighter. Um, so if you have a very light painting to start with, you probably don't want to put a very dark frame on it. Um, are there any questions so far? Yes? What type of lip at the top doesn't throw a shadow? I guess I've never... I, you know, we're talking about... There, there are some um, that this comes down and then in and then here's the glass. And there's some that have an angle. This frame doesn't have as much of a uh, shadow as some others. All of mine do have a little bit of shadow, but I've seen some that cast a shadow like this because this section is uh, very raised up from where the glass is. Does that answer? Yes. Yeah, so it's how far in the glass is. Yes. But doesn't the spacer cause a shadow? I mean, the space, wouldn't that spacer cause a shadow too? No, I don't think so because you can't see the spacer. It pushes, it, it, it pushes it back a little bit, but I don't think that's the big problem. I think it's okay. the way this is here. As an example, one of, one of Natasha's frames, see Lee's has this little inset, this, the way they made that lip, then this one has a liner that's added to the frame inside, and so this little piece really comes down to closer to the glass, so even yeah, though, part. then this part, so depending on how much shadow this will cause, by the time you get down under here, you may have not have as a shadow going down as far onto your painting. But then you also, that's part of this planning. If you, if you have this favorite frame, and you, you know you're going to be using this for something, and then you're painting something, and you've got you know, this fabulous mountain peak, <clears throat> probably a good idea, knowing that you're going to put it in this, to plan that the top of your mountain doesn't come up anywhere near the ed top edge of the frame or where the shadow is going to cast onto it because it'll ruin the composition of your painting. All right. And I have one other comment about that. If you're framing for someone's home, it's less of a problem. Uh, this shadow thing is more of a problem if you're in a show and there's spotlights coming at the work. Um, Unless uh, the home has a gallery light hang shining on it, it's probably not so much of a problem there in that kind of lighting. 
Next, Natasha is going to speak. Yeah, the, I was just going to add one more thing about that. I think the national show is just such a hard barometer because those lights are so far away from the work and they're so close to the work relative to how far away they are. I don't know how you can frame it and not get a big shadow. It's just that way. But you'll find that yeah, you'll find that you know a lot of frames have a lot of really raised things that are very very close to your your painting. Uh, you know, beautiful frames that otherwise are terrific, but maybe if you're thinking about national show or a show where you're going to be hanging in that sort of a, a high lofted ceiling, high lit sort of show, you want to stay away from something where you've got so much raised area up close to the painting because that's what's going to grab the shadow even worse. It's going to make the shadow even worse on that. Um, Many of the plain air paint, uh, frames are usually the ones that have a lot of shadow. It's, it's yeah, yeah. yeah and are some, some, some are worse them. and some are better. Some have a really raised rib on the inside of it that just it, it makes it really deep, you know, away from the paint. Yeah. yeah, so it's just stuff to consider. John? <clears throat> Does using a museum glass make a difference? Not in the shadow that the frame causes, no. Whenever you're considering frames and so forth, what I wanted to touch on a little bit was what galleries want, what, like if you're going to present your work to galleries, and I can tell you everything I thought I knew, I don't know, and every <laughs> time you think you have it figured out and even the gallery owner tells you what they want, then six weeks later you go and they go, oh, but, yeah, and they change their mind. So there's not a right answer there, so in lieu of there not being a right answer. If you're going to present work to a gallery, be consistent. It doesn't mean that everything has to have the same black frame on it, for instance. Just if you're going to go with, I, I would recommend that if you're going to approach a gallery uh, with your artwork, don't pick an ornate, ornate frame. Let it be a simple frame. Plain air frames are terrific, particularly out here. It's a little different story on the East Coast than, you know, other places they, you know, ornate's where it's at. But in terms of anything that you're going to do in the Southwest, plein air frames are your best friends. And it would be my suggestion if you're going to take work to a gallery. If you've got uh, work that some looks great in gold and some looks great in black, will be the same kind of consistent. Use some gold, use some black, but use a similar, say, simple profile kind of frame. A lot of the plein air frames come in both. So then that way, that gives the gallery owner, they, it gives them some room to breathe and they can say, well, I really pr prefer the gold or I really prefer the black. And it gives you a little somewhere to go there. Um, and it's a good idea, too, to look around at the galleries that you're presenting your, fr your framed pieces to and see what kind of frames the other people in the gallery are using. And um, I'm in a situation now that I've just changed galleries on Canyon Road, and I was worried about the framing because it seemed to me 90% of the gallery or the artists in that gallery are using very expensive, all customized framing, and I wasn't sure I could live up to that. So I just made sure all my frames were clean and without bonks and nicks, and very appropriate to the work, and and. The frame, you know, framing, you want to have a little width around the frame. The idea is to isolate your image. You want to isolate the image from whatever's going on around it. That's what, that's what that width is for. And it gives it a little sea of gold or a little sea of black or whatever color you choose to, to, so that you're just looking at your image. But I found that taking just very cleanly, neatly, consistently framed things up to this gallery, they were delighted. So. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I think I think to sum it up, stay simple, stay consistent. And like you said, I think you, you basically want a little window. You're looking at your image as though you're looking through a window. Mm -hmm. It is, and that's the 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 gift to isolating right. that with sure. a couple of inches sure. of frame sure. around it. It wall. takes kind of gets the busy out of the way. Right. Would it be important? in terms of consistency to not have part of them matted and part of them not matted or does that make any difference? Well we're going to talk about mats uh, in a little bit. I, I think 
that's a good question. But in terms of in terms of your own work, if it okay, if it were me, from the experience I've had, I would either stick to matting my work or not matting my work. I would go one way or the other. I think. Okay. March, did you have a? That's about what I was going to say. <laughs> I I don't. It didn't come up right now, but uh, one thing I think hopefully all of us are aware of is that you should not be using metal frames. I hope that mm -hmm. that goes sort of without saying. It does not highlight your work properly. It does not present your work in its best light and give the image of your work being uh, cut above, you know, a poster. It so, cheap, basically. Yeah, I mean, there, there are some really very expensive metal frames out there, but in general, they yeah. are to be avoided, and yes, you know, it, it just if you kind of you know, there are lots if you wanted to do <coughs> matting and a very simple wooden frame, you know, that's different. But frankly, if you're going to get one of the better metal frames, you can come out cheaper getting a wooden frame and not have the gallery go, you need to change this frame because you yeah. there's I don't know of any galleries that are going to be happy with a metal frame that I'm aware of, yeah. I'd like to make one more comment about the ornate. Um, it's, I think, very important to uh, avoid that unless you're framing for a particular person uh, and the home requires an ornate frame. If you're submitting to a, a juried show, most people are going to have more of a neutral um, or standard look, and then all of a sudden there's a frame that is all scrolly and maybe very, very dark and uh, burnished in high light and low lights. It's going to stick out uh, like a sore thumb, and um, that's all I, you'll see is the frame. Right. I was remembering our national show had a frame like that, mm -hmm. and the painting was very nice, but I couldn't get past the frame. So, if someone commissions you and says this is the kind, that's one thing. But for shows and galleries, uh, avoid the. The 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 la the other thing to remember too is that you can go out on all sorts of limbs with expensive framing, you know. And even if you've got the money, okay, let's say you just you know you won that nice lottery ticket. Like that. <laughs> but you know, oh, I mean, you can go get all this really great custom framing done. And if you're <coughs> in gallery sales long enough, you hear people go, "Oh, that frame's got to go," and that's going to be on somebody's sidewalk for five or ten dollars. <laughs> You know that you've put all that money into, whereas if you just get something that ta that's tasteful, that doesn't cost you even a fraction of that, then you're satisfying everything. You know, the, you're, they're not selling the frame; they're selling the art. Yeah. So, you know, you want it to. You, don't do that. Okay. One more, <laughs> one more point about ornate frames. This is just me as being somewhat of a perfectionist. But assuming you're going to be getting your frames, not specific custom made specifically to a, by a person who can deal with proper mitering and things. If you get an ornate frame, very often that design, when you get to the corner, they're not matching how that design comes together. If you had it custom made they and you know, hand carved, they can do that for you. And there's a man in Albuquerque who will do that and makes custom frames. So that's another issue about just sticking to things that are linear and you know they can this an ornate quality to Lee's thing because it's black and it's gold and it's got ridges and things but at the corners everything's going to come together right you know you get some rope design and all of a sudden you get to the corner it's going to look pretty funny if it doesn't match up right Good. okay so uh, okay, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit. If you decide that what you want to do is mat your paintings, there are a few key things to remember about matting. I brought in some black ones so you could see. First of all, there is something about the proportion and the, and the width of the mats that you put around your work. They should. The assumption also is that you're not going to use a nice wide mat and a nice wide frame. Generally, if you, the idea is that you have about three and a half to four inches surrounding your painting. So you can have a three inch <coughs> wide mat and an inch frame. That's going to give you that distance. Then 
you don't want to be doing it so you bought this standard size frame and you think okay I'm going to use this for this picture and then you start putting your picture in there and now you've got this thing where you got one inch on each side and three quarters at the top and an inch at the bottom or something. It should be the same measurement all the way around if you can't make it the same measurement all the way around the ideal thing is then to add any additional in the at the bottom so that it looks weighted but that's something that's more for like photography than painting but it should be just the same all the way around and then if you're going to you can double mat it so that you have a little bit of the second mat peeking out behind the front mat and that's generally about a quarter of an inch that you want to be using for that and one of the even when you're matting something bless you, you still need a spacer because you have these bevel edges that's this white stuff that's showing here at this angle if something happens to your painting it gets jostled or you haven't tapped it enough and enough loose pastel hasn't fallen off you don't want your stuff to fall down and be landing on this nice clean white bevel edge you show put that in the show it's just going to be like what was that person thinking why did they not have this clean when they put that out there so you need to on the back put some sort of spacer anything that touches your painting should be archival, pH neutral, acid free. I mean, there's a lot of terminology out there, but you know, going to Hobby Lobby and buying a piece of mat board may not be, unless they're saying that it's that way, because whatever's going to touch your painting could in fact damage the paper that your painting is on. But you place something behind your mat so that there's a little space between the mat and your picture. And then another perfectionist pet peeve of mine is when you're doing a mat, these happen to be inexpensive ones that I ordered from one of the art places just so I could have something to put things in the studio into and, you know, if I wasn't going to frame them. Cleanly <coughs> cut corners. You buy something like this, you know, professionally done. You don't have this little X at the bottom where your knife has gone through <laughs> and cut it. And you, if you do it carefully, you might be able to patch that up, but it's a little iffy. So if you have a mat cutter and you're going to cut your own mats, one of the things that I found out many years ago is if you, where you've drawn your cross lines about where you're going to go, if you take a straight pin and you just, or a push pin or something, but something very small, just push it into that intersection of those two lines as your knife gets to that it will sort of stop it so that you don't overcut. And if you, I can't remember exactly if you do have to go over, but at least you won't be, you know, if you have to pull it a little bit more, at least you won't be going over that. Um, now, when you're do, if you're doing a double mat, most of the time, I think the theory is, you know, this outer one is going to be like white or pale cream, something like and you might pick a color for the interior one that complements your painting. But don't go crazy with, you know, some bright red or fluorescent blue or something in there. Just, you know, keep in mind that you don't want, you want something that's going to work with your painting. You don't really want your frame to detract from the overall appearance of your painting. Um, and. I was going to talk about hinging and mounting things. I personally haven't ever gotten the hang of hinging, so I don't hinge anything. <laughs> I come unhinged. I don't. I don't hinge anything. <laughs> and also, I somewhere in an earlier lesson in painting, there was this thing about you know having cushioning behind your painting and not painting on something hard. So I don't pre-mount my paper. Be, uh, before I start a thing, because then I'm working on hardboard, and you know, sometimes uh, now I've given up this board because if it doesn't work out, now I'm throwing away not only the paper but the board as well. So uh, 
I use, and I can do this if I'm very careful, it doesn't seem to damage anything. I use this product called Double Tack, which you, you can buy it locally in small things, but I have to order it from one of the online places, and I get 18 by 24 sheets, and then I can cut it to what I need. And it's a very thin archival sticky stuff, sticky on both sides. So it's got like a paper on the outside and the on both sides of the sticky stuff. And so then I put that down, covering the whole of the board. And then I carefully position my painting and I open up a little bit like that and very gingerly pull it out from behind and just mount and use something, not my hand, to crush it. <laughs> I, I often use the paper that I've pulled off from one side then to put down on the top one and hold it down while I pull out and just kind of press on it so that it's mounted on onto the board. And so that's all an archival thing as well. But you could take your lead, I know does this, she has her work mounted on boards, I'm sure she'll and tell I'll you. I'll talk about that when I right. do the assembly of the frame. I wanted to mention one more thing about the mats. Uh, it's very, it takes a lot of practice and it's very hard, even with a good mat cutter, to cut a straight mat. Yes. And if your mat isn't perfect, don't use a mat. It's because it shows up so obvious. Mm -hmm. And it does mean, Nicholas is right, I mean, you need a mat cutter. This is not something that you can do with just a straight edge and holding a razor blade at some angle and hoping you're getting it right. I mean, you need one of those nice big board things. And, you know, with some practice, you will, in fact, be able to do it. Now, if you want to mat something, you could also just go to... Hobby Lobby or Michael, Michael's or Teresa's, I have, we have a list of resources. There are people who can cut mats for you and do it professionally and save you the trouble and then you can assemble your package afterwards. Now I just, tiny bit of touching on this thing, this passport too, since we're doing this matting thing. Mm -hmm. This is what Sarah Blumenschein mentioned in her um, presentation recently, and I know a lot of other people have done this. The French started this many, many years ago. They just put their glass directly on top of their painting, put a backing board on it, or if their painting was mounted already, and then you seal the edges of that whole package using one of these kinds of like frame sealing tape, or Lee has another kind there. and. As long as that glass isn't shifting against your painting, there shouldn't be any problem with anything. And even if it does sort of transfer to the back of the glass, essentially you're just looking through the glass, so you can't really see if it's on the back of the glass or if it's on on the painting itself. Yes, Paul? What do you do with the glass breaks? Then you've got a problem. <laughs> Hopefully it doesn't like shatter and go into your painting. If it just cracks, I suppose you just un you take a razor blade, you cut the, the seal off, and you get your painting out from behind it. But I know there was an artist we had here a while ago. It also makes storing your paintings and interchanging your paintings among frames quite simple. If it's already protected under glass and in this thing, you can pop it in and out of frames. But, it, but I do that with the spacer too. I mean, it's, it's already pre-sealed like that. Yeah, yeah. but then you're committing that piece, you know, then it's not the glass is part of the frame. The glass is now yeah. part of your work, and so you've yeah. now got the expense of the glass. But Greg yeah. at Framestead really discouraged doing that type of framing. He yeah. said that, you know, if you go in an area where there's mildew That's what I was and moisture, yeah. it's mm -hmm. not good. Yeah. But, I mean, I know there's different schools of thought. Yeah. Right. I think whatever applies here in the Southwest is very different than what would apply in um, the Southeastern uh, United States. Um, here I've never had mats or my paper bubble, but back East it always did, no matter what I would do. Um, so I think if you um, are going to use this method of against the glass, um, I would be hesitant to sell a painting to somebody who lives in a humid area if you have it done that way. I think if they're going to be here and they're not moving or giving, 
to someone in the human area, it's probably fine. Um, it's a controversial topic. Uh, I prefer not to do it that way, but some people still are um, going for that. Yes? Do you ever use dry mounting process? Well, in, in a sense, what I'm doing <coughs> using this double tack is similar to dry mounting. Yes. Uh, but it, it, if you're dry mounting, you need a dry mounting press. Right. And so you could take your work, if you want something mounted to a board by a dry mounter, then you'd have to take it to somebody who has a press. So that's what gives you something that's removable later? You don't um, I no. think this is pretty much, this it's, is it. That's it. It's I, stuck there forever. It tears much. the paper if you try to take it yeah. off. I, there may be something you could do yeah. by heating it to some level that yeah. might release it, but and maybe rubber cement thinner, but that's probably not a good thing with a pastel. So. <laughs> yeah. Because putting it in a um, mounting press, you, you, you have a a sheet on top of the work and you're pressing it onto a board to mount it, does that affect the pastels? I don't think yes. you want to do dry mounting after. I heard it, yes. Yeah. You, don't want to, you don't want to put a pastel on a dry mount press and try to dry mount it because you'll have to use something to protect the pastel from the plate and on the press. And I don't care how good a piece of paper is, whether it's glassine or something else, some of that is going to transfer on to the glassine or whatever. Mm -hmm and with the heat component to it, more will transfer onto it. Plus, because of the um, um, Murphy's Law, all the really important <laughs> yeah. stuff will transfer onto the last scene right and leave the crap. You might want to dry mount your paper before don't, you paint. There's, don't dry press. If you're, if you're going to dry don't. mount paper beforehand, just know ahead of time that if you get this beautiful sheet of blank paper and you're dry mounting it, you do lose some tooth in the process. It does take some tooth, so you know you might want to step up on whatever, however toothy you like your surface. Step up a little because it's going to back up whenever you get it on that press. And another along that line, I used to take my paper t um, to be dry mounted to a framer, and I'm kind of a perfectionist. And they told me that when they put the press top down just that swoosh of air would shift things a little bit, so they were always crooked slightly. And then I would have to then redo the things. I like to work on straight paper. And I feel that if, if I am using the d double tack and mounting and it's a little crooked, I did that, but if I'm paying somebody else to do it, I want it perfect. <laughs> uh, so there's some ins and outs. This double tack thing is, is really handy. Were there other questions? I had something to say about, I uh, just kind of non on the um, placing that the glass directly right. on the painting. If you're using um, purposely um, putting on your your own oh, surface, right. and you want your brush strokes and you know like crazy people <laughs> want a big mess, uh, uh, you know, to in order to paint your pastel on. If you lay that glass. Uh, straight on there, that's just not going to work. No. Yeah. Because yeah. Of the, got ridges. the natural yeah. ridges mm -hmm. and all of that. So, for if you're putting your own surface on and it's, you know, swishy mm -hmm. and brushy and all of that stuff, then um, I would not recommend putting mm -hmm. glass directly on that because it's yeah. going to make problems. Sure. I just had one question. I just started mounting my own. Uh, Marie is mm -hmm. going. Mm -hmm. She's going. Oh. Took her money and left. Yeah. Well, she showed me how to do it. And I've been mounting it, but it's different. The paper is different when it's mounted than it is when it's Yeah, you lose yeah, the tooth. Mm -hmm. Is that what it is? Yeah. Well, and it's also not that soft feeling, like if you're painting against a board, as opposed to putting a few sheets of paper behind the thing that you're working on. So it affects how hard you're pressing on your pastel and things. Yeah. There's this. It probably just takes getting used to it. Yes, Paul. Um, if you dry mount your surface um, and you and what Natasha says is true, you'll lose a little bit of tooth. After you do your preliminary drawing, lightly spray everything with workable mat fix it, you'll get some of that tooth back. Mm -hmm. Good point. Mm -hmm. And I find with um, the sanded papers that I use, 
Uh, and I prefer to mount my paper onto uh, a board, a uh, museum board, before painting. It's got some give because of the type of board that I choose. And I'm so used to it that I don't find it's a significant loss of uh, tooth. Um, I think we should move on. Yeah, I think okay. so. So the next part, um, framing, I'm going to do my little demo. Um, and the parts of a frame, this is what I'm going to frame my painting in. And this was a frame that I got, I think, from Frontier Frames. Is that in, in um, Santa Fe? Because it came from Santa Fe. And um, I wouldn't be able to afford to go in and have them frame a, a painting. It's very expensive. The ones that I get uh, normally to use are from Omega Molding, and it's a wholesale price, and it's so much uh, less expensive. But I decided um, to frame my painting with this. This uh, is the lip overhang, and it's about a good quarter of an inch. And then this depth is the rabbit, R-A-B-B-E-T. <coughs> and depending on the width of the rabbit, um, depends on how you uh, end up <coughs> positioning your work in here. This frame, which has a painting in it, is one of my favorites to use. Uh, this is also from Omega. It um, is not as wide as some. It's two and a half inches instead of three. And the rabbit depth is less. So I use offset clips to put it on because it's raised up here. And then I put a dust cover on it. I get a wrinkle or two, but overall it's not too bad. This one has a wrinkle here. Usually I only have the wrinkles in this little area. Um, and I don't go over the whole thing. I cut the angle off so that it's all in this area rather than raised and down. Um, so that if people are touching it, it's not going to be poking a hole through here. What are on the corners there? These corners come on the frame. Oh, okay. It's just reinforcement. Okay. And I don't put the paper here because then this is going to be um, a gap if I put the paper <coughs> here. And if you touch it, it could rip. And the offset clips is because it raises it up. Um, but it's still fairly neat. Sorry. And here's the back of another painting where it's all smooth. This is from Omega as well, and this is a three-inch frame. Okay, yeah. And um, when I put my <coughs> painting together to put in here, it's flush with this, so I, I don't have anything raised or I don't have anything concave back there. And I brought... Marilyn just held up the thing, oh, the rings. Uh, make sure that we talk about not using those eyes. Right, yeah, right. Anymore. That's kind of old-fashioned. I brought these two uh, frames to show you um, for why I'm choosing this one. And I like to do my paintings on uh, this board. It's a Crescent 1153. It's got more of a cottony feel than some boards. And I use the double tack to mount it. It is so quick and easy. So quick and easy. Uh, less than five minutes, I think, for something this size. And I, I like to have it um, like this so that when I'm handling it, I've got a place to handle instead of trying to carefully hold on to it and not get fingerprints on my work. And also, some frames, like this one especially, the opening that they have here, they always leave a little extra uh, for moving. Um, it's usually only like an eighth of an inch. But I swear these are more than that. So when I frame, I cut my board. Depending on what the painting is, uh, since I know there's a, a quarter inch overhang of the frame, this one, I don't know how well you can see, but there's uh, extra on here and less on here. This is how I do it if I'm participating in a, a plein air event. This was from uh, plein air Moab, and I didn't use it. Um, I had to quickly assemble the frame, so I pre-cut everything. 
I don't like to paint on the foam core because it's harder to tape to my board. Um, this is much, much easier, but it can be done this way. Is the foam core acid free? Yes, this is acid free okay. foam core. I use the double tack to mount it, and that's um, acid free also. And I cut it so that there'd be a little bit more, if I had a bush over here, it wouldn't be right on the edge type of thing. This had a lot of space that wasn't really important, so I cut closer here. And that takes up the um, give, but I still leave a little bit of, of give, uh, just in case of expansion. So, let's see, let me... To carry this, um, I put my, I really didn't want it to be scratched, so I wrapped it in paper towel, and then it's in the thing that the glass. This is AR glass, non-reflective, and you, generally speaking, I don't want to touch it with your fingertips because it'll leave marks. My fingers are so dry that um, I usually don't have that problem. And I've put spacers, frame text spacers. Uh, the ones that Marilyn has on that uh, chart are um, black, and I use the clear. She's got both on. Oh, she does. Well, I don't. No, they're they're black. So I'm using it's a, an S, um, squared off S, an eighth of an inch. And I used to use the adhesive. The reason I don't do that anymore is because Frentech recommended that I upgrade to the S kind because it's possible that over time the glue might stop adhering mm -hmm. and it could fall down. Um, and if you do use the adhesive, if your painting is horizontal, you want the longer pieces top and bottom, the shorter pieces on the sides, so that if it does lose its adhesive, it's going to be held in place by the positioning. But when I do this kind, I, let's see, how am I? Yeah, sure. While Lee's doing that, this is the sheet that shows the frame text spacers, they have the frame space, which is the one Lee is using, fits around the edge of the glass, and then their econo space, which is the sticky stuff. So, um, you can like your see that. No, it's just I need to just make space. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I see there's a hair on here. <gasps> uh, so when I uh, do this at home, I took the one thing off, and this is not the one, this is. I lay it on the edge of the table so that um, I have room to work and not have to be pressing on the glass itself. And I put this, uh, you have to make sure you put it so that it's raised on the upper side, so the uh, bottom side is all flat. You don't want to do some of them raised and some of them <laughs> flat. <laughs> and then I, I put something over so I can put my hand on the glass. And they're not, it's not moving for me right. and it just fits on, and it's really easy. But when I get them, sometimes they're squeezed shut, so I just run my uh, fingernail under it a few times so that I can get it um, in there easily. And that's just picture frame glass? This is AR glass. Okay. Museum. Anti-reflective. Yeah, anti <laughs> I get museum. it from... Not museum. Not museum. No, no. no. AR. I it's different. It's one step museum. below a museum. Is that the same as conservation clearance? No. 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 I use AR glass because my budget doesn't allow me to uh, use museum glass consistently. 
So it's is much that really, uh, really had to reflect it? Yes, the yes, 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 yes. The museum glass also ha has a UV protective factor. This does this not. This does not. <coughs> but all UV. glass has a little bit just because it's a barrier. Um, and I get my glass cut by Teresa's frame shop. She's very, very reasonable. Uh, she's very nice to artists. I think her whole clientele is just artists or word of mouth. She doesn't advertise at all. And she cuts the glass for me. And um, I can see in my transporting, I've gotten some dust. It seems to me that the good thing about those, what do you call them, S? Yeah, oh, the those frame space. That you don't have sharp edges. Correct. After you put those Right. On. Right. Does yes. it widen it at all? It widens it. it, it you're going to have problems dropping it in a standard frame. It widens it a little bit. Um, it, it's no problem with this one. With this frame, I have to use some mat board and put it in along to take up space. this area to take up space because otherwise it's like this much space on either edge. And they overdo the amount of space. But this frame has less space, so it's, it fits, but it's not going to wobble. So um, <coughs> I'm going to use this um, dry air, or whatever you call it, dust. dust. <laughs> Don't use that on your painting. <laughs> 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 hey, I had a guy who was framing a large piece who took about half my painting off doing oh, it. Yeah. Oh, but, but he used a big thing. And then he called me and goes, uh, Whoops. we got a problem. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Totally Which is why you should frame your own painting. <laughs> you know, sometimes you're better off doing things yourself. At least if you goof it up, you do you goof it up. May I, may I also tell you something about painting your glass initially? If you use a dishwashing soap, a liquid, on a rag under hot water, you will get a very clear glass without using all of this spray stuff and towels. Lay it down on a fairly lint-free, meaning a towel that's been through the laundry a number of times, surface, and then just dry it with your rag, and then hold it up and look at it. You will be surprised at how quickly you can use it. And it's the same way for cleaning windows, is mm -hmm. to use dishwashing soap, not, you know, just when I get my glass from Teresa, it, it needs very little cleaning, and sometimes I've touched it and my hand was moister than usual, so what I do is just take a, a soft washcloth, a tiny bit of um, ammonia-free glass cleaner, spray it on here, a tiny bit, and then just rub it off and then take the dry part and continue rubbing and there's no problem. But I've rarely, the only time I've done the whole glass is when I am switching out frames. And the good thing about using standard sizes is you can switch out frames. So this looks pretty good. The, um, She's got a question. Yes? Do you, do you prefer non-glare as opposed to regular? Yeah. No, non-glare has a frost to yes. it. And to me, that's very distracting to see this fuzziness. This does the same thing, and it's clear no matter what angle you're viewing it. That's why the AR is so terrific. Okay. Um, the problem with museum glass, too, is that the way that they have it coated, it's coated on both sides, and you have to mount that glass the right side in. So it's more of a hassle that way. I can't even do that. And then also a problem with uh, museum encoded glass, also with, uh, what, how did you pronounce that framing method? Or oh, pass part, two. Pass part, pass part two. two. You know, if you've got a coated glass that you're trying to have a nice painting that you just can see the work and you're not looking at your reflection, Sorry. you put that directly on the work, that coating you know, over time, houses jar, things move, and so forth, and I can't imagine, depending on your surface, that you wouldn't grind into that glass just a little bit, too, so. But don't some shows disallow uh, angular glass? I think Masterworks does. Not, not AR. Non-glare is just terrible. Non-glare they don't <laughs> want. <laughs> but a like we had two, yeah. uh, three at the national show that were yeah. uh, non-glare. Yeah. Uh, plexiglass, oh, yeah, yeah, and you stood to the side of them. You can't even see the pain. Mm -hmm. So yeah. uh, that 
And I, I forgot to mention before um, talking about hinges. Um, I don't hinge either. And when I was living back east and I was using mats because that's what was acceptable back east, uh, my framer used this framer's tape too. It's shiny, and he would just um, put it over the top two corners of the. Um, the paint like yeah, here and, and here, oh, just sorry. down on a, a, about the amount that the overlap would be, and he would attach it to the backing board, and then he would just lay the other one on top. And he didn't uh, seal them together because um, I used neutral mats, and if they were kept clean, I could switch out paintings with those mats too. And then. Um, the frame tech, whether it's the um, S1 or the adhesive, I cut them with um, pliers that um, from the garden shears type of thing. You can cut them with wire cutters, but I didn't happen to have that, and these cut very well. And that's what I've just I like stuck. It. Uh, shears has a pipe, uh, rubber tube cutter. It's like a razor blade, and it works mm -hmm. perfectly on that. Yeah, so I've just stuck with this because it's what I had handy rather than going out to buy something. And I, um, I line it up uh, on the glass and then mark it with a pen and then use these to just cut it. So I've got... Did you cut, excuse me, you cut it square? You cut, kind of cut an angle? No, square, square. straight, straight. Yeah, so it's squared off. Um, the company that sells the spacers also <coughs> recommends you use a wet stone to smooth out the edges of the glass so that the S-type spacer will slide on easier. It really makes a difference. And you also and, don't cut your hands. Right. Yeah. And you can buy that, you know, from the, the, the company, you know, that it sells the, the framing stuff. So that also is handy. Right. And I also have a comment about mounting. There's a product called Perfect Mount, which is a self-adhesive crescent mat board, which you can also buy in different sizes from some of the different art supply um, companies that I found out about that from Karen Margulies a few years ago. And so that also is very handy for mounting your pastel paper. And uh, so mm -hmm. that's, and it is uh, also archival. So that's another mm -hmm. thing to consider. The, um, I was aware that uh, FrameTech recommends that, but I've never had any problem doing it the way I've been doing. Um, and I don't have to get a little stone to do that. So, um, but you do have to be careful of burrs uh, if you don't smooth them down. <coughs> but I well, the person cutting the glass does that as part of their glass cutting thing. They yeah. just mm -hmm. wipe. I've never them. had a problem with burrs and things like that. So maybe I've been lucky, but I've been framing myself for many years and um, haven't had the problem. So. Here's the painting I'm uh, going to do. There's a question here, or comment. Oh. Yes. yes. Speaking of the S spacers, if you're going to use S, spa S spacers, make sure that you're really, really careful about how the glass is cut because if it's undercut any at all, you have the risk of having the lip of the S thing be outside the, outside the edge of the floor. I found that more with the adhesive. I've never had that happen with the S. But I had it happen a lot with the adhesive. Um, yeah, and the way the glass is cotton versus the uh, width of the frame, yeah, you have to be careful of that. Um, I've had that happen too, but what I do to remedy that is I'll put a little extra uh, spacer on between the glass and the mm -hmm. side of the frame, and usually that's sufficient just in a couple of places just to hold it. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it, it happens. It really does. Like you said, it's pretty common, actually. So this is the painting, and it's uh, mounted onto um, the crescent. So it started out like this, and <coughs> I trimmed it uh, by measuring how much I, I needed. There's a little bit more on this side um, than the others. And I chose this frame for it because when I um, put it on this, I thought the gold was uh, just a little bit too uh, glary and, and brassy. 
And I, where's the other frame I have? The black angle? Yeah. I consider this, and I like this look, but I didn't have a free one, and it would have meant I'm framing something, which I didn't want to do at this time. <coughs> so I thought that this would work. And I, I think that um, either is a good choice. I really did not like this one. So you have to go with the simultaneous contrast thing, what something <coughs> looks like is dependent upon what's around it. And uh, that's why if, if this did not have um, the silver, this is silver, um, the gold is uh, much brassier looking. If, if this frame did not have these inner and outer uh, silver, I think that black would be too heavy, but this helps cut it down. So this is what it looks like now. And because I didn't work on f uh, foam core, I cut a piece of foam <coughs> core and put that in. And then I have a point shooter. And I make sure that uh, I'm holding it so that it's not going to uh, wiggle. And for this size, I just put one on the, the short side. And then I check it to make sure nothing popped off um, and it looks OK to me. Sometimes a bit of uh, pastel <coughs> might jump off, um, or there's dust that I didn't realize I had. And then two on the other side. What's that called? The point shooter. Okay. I think mine is by Fletcher. There's Fletcher and Logan make really good ones, but another two have up there, but I use one that's just acting. Just I like it. Yeah, some woods There's were no too hard for me to do that because I have one of those. That's what this, this is what you're talking about. Is, right? is, is doing it this this way? Is substantially cheaper than having Teresa's frame show here? Oh, oh yes. Lord. My yes. 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 However, Teresa is one of the most reasonable in town. If there's a, a frame shop, excellent work that they do, framing concepts uh, in the Heights. I can't afford to have them, uh, even if I just buy the frame and I do it, I can't afford their frames. Teresa's are very affordable. And she's very good. I buy the, the glass cut when I need um, this crescent she orders for me. Uh, I don't do a lot of ordering, so I would have to pay shipping most likely. And sometimes I've gotten the, the corners bent. Um, so she orders in bulk, and uh, she'll order, and I can take two or five or what, whatever. She's Where's very, very... She's on silver. I think I have Rogers in my phone, but we I don't have, have a, We have a list of suppliers and also supplies needed. We can pass around if you'd like that now. You'll yeah. we'll give it to me. I'll also put it on the film, too. Yeah. Okay. So now here's the back, and it's now ready for the dust cover and then the, the wire. And I didn't do that part for this demo because it would take a little bit more time. But with this frame being totally flat, I would... Um, Put the dust cover just a little bit out farther. I don't like to have them all the way to the edge, just about here around. And I put um, double tack, <laughs> excuse me, ATG tape, and um, I start in one corner and then I stop almost middle, and then I put a short piece in the middle, and then continue around. And then another piece, short piece in the middle, continue around. Why do you do it that way? I'm gonna tell you. <laughs> and the reason I do that is so that the first things I pull up are the two, the middles, because then it's not going to shift. And then I peel it off and I just go like this and push it down. Um, my framer back east taught me that because back east um, it was very, very humid and things would, so when you do that, 
first it cut down on the the warping, but here also it just cuts down on any movement. Yes. Um, a long time ago, when I used to do needlepoint, I would frame my own stuff. In this book that I had on framing it, they said, you know, like your brown paper, take uh, a spray bottle with water, mm -hmm. and you put a, a line of white glue around on your frame, and you take this wet, wet it down paper, and you put it on there, and smooth it out with your hands, and let it dry, and it, it's like as tight as a drum. No, oh, and maybe if the paper is wet, that works, but if you don't do that, the glue, unless you use a super, super fine amount, it will dry kind of rippled at the edge. I, I, it never that's the way I think, too. Yeah. Yeah. Wet glue around kind of and wet it. Uh, but you have to be careful about wetting on pastel, too. Yeah. Well, yeah. if you've got all your backing in there, I've sure never not. had a problem. I haven't had a problem either. I either. find the tape is very easy. <laughs> So I, I mentioned before that on this kind, I use the offset rings um, here so that it's raised a little bit. And you could use the offset clips depending on your shooting and the depth of your rabbit. You can turn them upside Opposite. down so that it will yeah. press the interior Inside. into right. it. Sure. And then, but then you've got screw heads to deal and with. And then the other thing um, I do is, well, this was in our um, small work show, so it still has this tag. I put a code um, on the back, I put my title and my name, uh, and then I'm a PSA signature, so I put that on. And Marilyn and I were doing uh, coordinating of shows for the Open Space Visitor Center, and countless numbers of people would bring their paintings in, and there'd be nothing on the back. And it's very important to, to put your name and the title in case this gets separated, people will still know. Yes? My last, my first two years in college, I worked in a music and art shop that I did bring. And I know this is from the dark ages, but it works. Of course, we use rubber cement, and then we put paper, the round paper over. And we would use a fingernail tile going at an angle because an absolutely straight line doesn't ding your, um, your frame. And my husband cut a block of wood and put a medium sandpaper on, on the block of wood, which made it easier. But you just, mm -hmm. I use the double stick tape around the outside, set the paper on, and you just go around the edge and you can go this way and make a clean cut. The back of my painting, you can't tell where the paper ends and the wood begins mm -hmm. because it's right up to the front. So that's a real easy and... That's a cool trick. Yeah. You mean a, a metal fingernail file, not an emery no, board. No, no, an emery board. board. Yeah. So are you saying that you can't tell where one begins even when it's up here? No, I go right to the edge. Yeah. Well, because of this, most of my friends have this uh, triangle on each yeah. corner, I want to have some space yeah, there. Yeah, that looks um, And I also put... Um, <coughs> a little mini bio with a picture of me and a couple of um, f paintings. And then um, this is my old one. Uh, this painting's framed with AR glass. But now I'm using something that's a little bit more. Um, but this fr painting is framed with AR anti-reflective glass. <coughs> Clean the glass with only a non-ammonia glass cleaner. Do not use Windex. Put a small amount of cleaner on a lint-free cloth towel. Paper towels may scratch the glass. Spraying cleaner directly on the glass may cause spotting and streaking. And then I have my website and my Facebook page on it. So this is what I'm now using on the back instead of the um, little. Because I found this was not enough information. Um, some people just don't get I mean, even art people. I've had my paintings come back and there'd be adhesive residue on my painting because the wall label, they'd stick back right here. And these were people in a jury art show, uh, an art society. So um, you can't assume people know. Or stick it on the frame. And then or stick it on the frame and, and then it, goes it pulls. Through. Yes, I've had that too. Um, and I've had people write on my backing instead of doing something like this. And that bothers me too, especially when it's in pen. Um, so don't assume anything about what people know. Um, are there any questions? Yes. When I'm, when I'm doing the, the back like that, 
before I do anything, um, I use an awl and punch in and then screw in for the D-rings. Before I do any of that stuff, I'm going to put a little piece of tape on the side with a little point so I can find that little spot later on. So after it's covered in brown paper, I'm not trying to drill into things with glasses there so I can screw things in. That's what Margie I'm uses to too. Oh. I've never had any trouble with doing it this way. Uh, it never I, goes... I like to go ahead and do my drilling so I can just yeah. screw in later. Yeah. I use an awl and um, I use this little handheld screwdriver um, electric and it's got a very tiny um, charger. You just plug it you in. You can also buy self starting screws which are terrific because I don't ever start the hole. I just screw the thing in. Whatever's easy. Fast. Skip a step. But, but yeah, self starting screws are terrific because they just they go in very very easily. I a, tip, a tip I found with the drill bit, uh, I usually measure the screw and put a piece of tape at, at the furthest length of what the screw is so that the tape hits before you Yeah, it's drill really bad to get a hole coming out on the front side of the <laughs> One of the things I just wanted to say, just like the technical thing about working on them, I agree with Natasha. I don't, sometimes I drill, but most of the time I don't think the wood is that difficult to screw into with, you know, and I just screw it in. But um, when I do mine, I and I'm sure Lee probably does as well, we're not working on this kind of a tape. No. I, always, I, always have, I have one of those kind of small carpet pad things, and I just put that down so that the frame is on something that's not going to scratch the front of your frame. And then if you can get frames that have these reinforced corners, that's much preferable to the ones that seem to be just mitered and glued together. And some of them, like this one, has reinforced little pieces that they put in their little v, v kind of things to hold them. Those are pretty strong. They're pretty strong, but often, especially if you're getting those ones that Mr. Lopez brings from Mexico, that their level of craftsmanship isn't quite as high. And so, like, when I get them before I start doing anything, I just use a staple gun because I tried these other things and I couldn't get them into it. But I will staple across the miter just because at a certain point, dry or wet, or depending, you know, things start coming apart. So the one, if you can get the ones within your budget that have these clothes, I mean, this is, different, this is sort of a closed corner one. You don't see that actual cut there. That's, that's a preferable thing. this is not. Thing. You, there is, you can see the line here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then, like, Lee is using her point shooter. Now, many years ago, somebody, and I don't know exactly why, but they said about, oh, you know, you could dislodge the pastel, pastel by using the shooter. So mm -hmm. I got this. It's a, technically a framer's bread plier and when I was researching to get URLs and stuff um, on Frametech site apparently they're now selling these right. but I got mine at Woodworker Supply in town. I mean you know if you can avoid going to an art supply store it may be less expensive. Frametech is really economical. Yeah. And about these I had one that's what I started with um, and some, I was back east, so I was not using this style, and I was using some wood frames. And some woods are very, very hard, and I couldn't do that. Yeah. So I switched to this, but I didn't want the rattle, that's why I hold it against me. And for paintings that are too big, I put a towel against the, the wall on the, car I have carpet in mine, put towel against the wall, push this against the towel, and then use the point shooter. Um, holding it tight on this side so there's no give for bigger paintings. But I do like that and, one. and this is just my way, Natasha's way, Marilyn's yeah, way. No it's not right the, the <laughs> end, you know, it's what okay. we do. Two things. Something was going around that never got here. Oh. And then the mm -hmm. other thing is, uh, what kind of wire are you using? Oh, we're getting to wire. We're coming to wires very soon. This is the wire I use. It's coated. And I think that the way I attach is similar to what you're talking about, the larks. I don't know what the knot is called, um, but 
Natasha's going to talk about that. Just five more yeah, minutes. Five oh, okay. I'm going to. I'm going to just pass around these two sheets. Um, this is supplies and tools. This is resources. Of course, you know, once you go on the website, you can find a lot of information, like on Frame Tech site and. Um, Lee is using Teresa. I use a person named Mike Osborne. A lot of artists may know him. Um, he works out of his home, but he orders the AR glass for me in cases of, I don't remember how many sheets, but you know, not that many. And he will cut it for me when I need it. And he also does cut, he cuts mats, he mounts board. According to Bud Edmondson, his charge for mounting is significantly less than Teresa's. And um, he does make custom frames. I think Peggy Orban was using him for making frames. So there are, and this all, all this information will be in the newsletter review of the program, as well as I think on the video. Will that information be on the newsletter or on the website? Yeah, that's what I said. Yeah. <laughs> so, so real quickly, um, this is to reinforce what we were talking about in terms of framing and shadow and all that stuff. I always, I, I work on board. I want it to be hard. I want it to be like doing graffiti on the side of the restaurant. Um, and um, I only use 16th inch of the frame tag, the, the skinniest, because on this board I know that I don't have to worry about any eventual like uh, waving of the paper so it won't be laying up against the glass. It's never going to lay up against the glass. So this is with a 16th inch, inch spacer. Um, and then unlike these guys, I don't paper the back. So this is actually the back of the board that I work on. I don't have any need to put more foam core or any of that stuff. I don't mind that it dips in. I'm okay with that. I use framer's tape and I go through and I, after I have put lots of uh, the points in there, I want to be sure it's in there good and solid. Um, and I'm, I'm really careful whenever I put in points is I try to put them within an inch of the corners to be sure the corners are locked in really nice, you know? So whatever it is I do through here, fine. But I always like to be sure I lock the corners in really good and tight. Natasha, if you could put it at an angle closer to the camera. Is that it? Yeah, that's good. Okay. So, and I, this is sort of overkill for the, for the wiring, but I wanted to show you there's two things that I do whenever I do the wiring. The standard notion is that you place the hinge, always hinges, never those little eye screw I think, never use those. Um, but the hinges need to go like between a quarter and a third of the way on your painting. That's sort of the standard philosophy with that. Um, I don't like to put them too low because if you do and you have a whole lot of swag up here, you're asking that painting to lay out against the wall. My, my aim is to get that thing to lay up <coughs> against the wall. So if you have a painting that has a very, very long bottom, let's say, you know, a long, narrow, landscape-shaped one like this, I, I use those uh, from Mexico frames because <laughs> my budget allows for them. And so I don't have these corners that hold on. And what I do is, if it's a heavy painting, which this isn't particularly heavy, and I wouldn't have done it if I wasn't trying to show you guys, but I do a compound wiring deal here where I'm putting, I'm putting hinges on the bottom. I pull it up through, twist it, twist it twice, and um, you know, use it this way, you know, sure. tie off my ends at the bottom. Extra because forward. what this does is, uh, over time, all of your weight's cinching in here. The weight of everything that's in this frame is going down. So, in order not to, over time, have this bottom piece of molding droop or swag or warp, and also to keep the corners from coming apart or starting to, to, to have some space, if you've got this compound wire, on something that's particularly long or heavy, then that will keep that from happening or at least help it from, from happening. Um, I use what's called a lark's head knot. It's called a cow hitch and called all kinds of other things. If you look it up online, there's a fine tutorial on how to tie the knot. But uh, it's a pretty secure, pretty secure knot. And, 
and I usually, whenever I'm uh, putting the wire on, I'll keep about two inches of wire out, and that's that full two inches that you see. Yeah, that full two inches that you see wound up down there. There's plenty there. There's plenty if anything should slip or if it should, you know. And, and the last thing on wiring, because I know we're out of time, is this one's hanging a little long, and I, that's regrettable. What I like to do is I like to have that wire just below where this is so that whatever mechanism they're using to hang it on the wall is going to just bury itself in the back of this painting and not make it have to bump out. That's wiring. Ta da! Thank you. It's headed up to its new home. Thank you, guys.